Lately within the melee community, discussions surrounding box legality have reached an all-time high. The vitriol surrounding this controversial third-party controller have been boiling for many years, and things have finally reached the tipping point. On October 29th, the Rule Set Committee published a rule set that's being advised for tournament organizers to adopt starting in January. The rule set contains many changes that are being made to the box, which is what this video will focus on. This video will take the stance that most of the changes being proposed are unreasonable, and that the firmware being provided by the committee ought to be vetoed. This also represents the stance of my partner Altimore, who I've discussed the box heavily with and also collaborated with on other projects. The two of us would like to encourage for the second opinion being provided here to be given a fair evaluation, as the decisions made at this juncture will have long-lasting implications for the Melee community. For the viewer's assistance, I've attached links to the rule set document as well as several other resources to this video's description. Also, please don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy this type of Melee content. To preface this video, I figured I'd include a segment in which I briefly offer my perspective. The difficulty in designing and maintaining the box has been the need to study the Melee engine, which is a niche scientific field. Prior to the box's development, I wasn't well versed in Melee mechanics at all. The direction my YouTube channel took in more recent years was inspired by the findings I made throughout the process of researching the game, which was something I did out of necessity. From my perspective, the vitriol that accumulated among GameCube controller users over the years was inevitable. Losing to or having a difficult time beating someone who's using a third-party controller is bound to cause frustration, especially when that controller's behavior isn't well understood. This has led to many reputable top players expressing the sentiment that the box is problematic. However, the discussion is consistently disorganized and rarely ever quantifies why the box is a problem. In creating this video, I'm seeking to help people understand the intricacies of the two controller archetypes. This will provide the discussion with the direction that it needs. There were many complicated design decisions that I made with the intention of balancing the box around the GameCube controller to the highest possible degree, while at the same time prioritizing a seamless experience. This approach is what led to the box's success. With all due respect to the committee, I must advise against the set of changes to the box that's being proposed. Over the course of this video, I'll be conveying why these changes undo much of the careful rationale that I devised, all while compromising the enjoyability of the controller and accomplishing very little in terms of balance. I would encourage for the committee to fully review this video and work together with me in finding better solutions. The first chapter of this video will explain how gameplay changes are categorized. I'll start with an example of a rumor so that I can show an example of how I would narrow down what the box is better at. Surely by this point everyone has heard the complaint that the box's aerials are allegedly broken. The complaint is often made in reference to the box's ability to perform full drift aerials on frame 1 with ease. A lot of people attribute this advantage to the box when the majority of it can be true for the GameCube controller as well. If a Z-Jump layout is used and a 1.0 cardinal fix is given to the GameCube controller's analog stick, then things are almost completely equal. The only advantage the box has at that point has to do with Nair. Since Nair is performed with the A button, the box is marginally better at drifting right after the Nair is performed. This is because you'll have an easier time inputting 1.0 on the very next frame on a box. A GameCube controller, on the other hand, usually needs two frames to make it to 1.0. This does lead to the box having a microscopic advantage in terms of drift. However, the advantage is nowhere near what it would be if 1.0 Cardinal and Z-Jump were viewed as being box exclusive. The reason I bring up the example of aerials is because it shows how this discussion often isn't organized properly. From my perspective, there are three categories of gameplay changes. The first category is gameplay mechanics, which pertains to in-game mechanics that the box might be advantaged in that can be fairly addressed through software. This does not include input sequences which require a timing lockout. Adjusting gameplay mechanics is generally the healthiest and best way to create balance between the GameCube controller and box. The second category is semi-arbitrary lockouts. This is in reference to the deliberate addition of timing lockouts which restrict input sequences that are unrealistic to perform on a GameCube controller. While the exact motions that would warrant a lockout, as well as the number of frames they ought to be locked out by, is a somewhat arbitrary subject, there are certain cases in which a lockout is mandatory. Finally, the third category is quality of life intrusions. This category refers to changes that go beyond the scope of isolated game mechanics. These changes generally involve the deliberate addition of poor performance in the sense that they create interferences elsewhere, introduce a logical behavior, etc. These types of changes are intrusive and undermine the efforts made to provide a clean experience. Now that I've explained the three categories, I'll show what falls under each of them. 
The gameplay mechanics category consists of two subcategories. The first one is precision nerfs. Precision nerfs are in reference to coordinates that the box isn't allowed to pinpoint for the sake of competitive fairness. Here's a diagram of what all of the precision nerfs except for up B and air dodge look like in case you're curious. The second subcategory is automatic advantages. These are mechanics that the box is advantaged in even after nerfs are applied. There are 12 automatic advantages in total. Z-Jump is also worth mentioning because the GameCube controller needs it in order for its layout to be on par with the box. However, I consider Z-Jump separate since it can be obtained through hardware modification. Next I'll cover semi-arbitrary lockouts. The two motions that are mandatory to address are double quarter circle smash DI and pivot upward and downward tilts. Each of these are given four frame lockouts on the box. The number of four is chosen because it fills up SDI windows of six frames, which are common, and because the smash attack buffer that needs to be shut off for pivot tilts lasts four frames. My thought process is that it's important not to expand this category past what's absolutely necessary because lockouts can create conflict with other motions. Furthermore, there may not be as strong of a justification for the number of frames to lock out by as there are for these two techniques. Finally, there are no quality of life intrusions on the box. The committee has proposed a few of them, however, and so I'll make it clear which those are as we go along. Now that I've gone over the categories of gameplay balance, I'll explain the committee's proposals. Within the document that was published on October 29th, the following gameplay changes are listed. Redistribution of up B angles. Removal of L and R button non-dedicated modifier. Changes to upward and downward pivot tilt timing lockout. Addition of up tilt from crouch timing lockout. Addition of pulse smash DI timing lockout. Enforcement of neutral SOCD. Enforcement of coordinate fuzzing. And the enforcement of the travel time algorithm. I've listed the categories that each of these changes fall under as to keep people informed. I've also noted that the removal of the L and R non-dedicated modifier is actually a buff to the box. The first change we'll go over are the changes to the upward and downward pivot tilts timing lockouts. I've decided to cover lockouts first because they're the easiest changes to get out of the way. The committee's proposal is for these pivot tilts to have lockouts of 8 frames rather than 4 frames, and for the A button to produce a smash attack if it's pressed within that window, which is different from the current method of having A not output anything. The aspect of this change that I would strongly advise against is making the lockout for downward tilts more than 4 frames. This is because the quarter circle pivot method lets you safely shut off the smash attack buffer in that direction on a GameCube controller. The smash attack buffer lasts for 4 frames, and so there's no need to exceed that. However, this method doesn't exist in the upward direction, which makes things more complicated. The first thing worth knowing is that on the official box firmware, you can always perform a pivot sequence which involves pointing at modifier X's coordinates in quadrants 1 or 2 for 4 frames in order to shut off the smash attack buffer. Then you can pivot up tilt on frame 5. This is exploitative because the GameCube controller isn't as good at pointing at this area directly after a pivot. The way the committee's firmware differs from the official box firmware is that it doesn't allow you to point at this area at all after a pivot. Instead, it forces your stick further upward and into tap jump territory. This method is the only way to ensure an upward pivot tilts nerf works for more than 4 frames. The committee's nerf method has merit for upward pivot tilts. However, I would advise for the number of 8 frames to be changed to 9 if this method is used. 9 is the non-arbitrary number that should be used in this situation because it's the largest number that you can lock out tilts by without creating conflict elsewhere. This is because of the way the box interprets a horizontal waveland input. When you perform a horizontal waveland, the box will interpret the input as a pivot if the stick is released on the very next frame. Since air dodge landing lag lasts 10 frames, you wouldn't want to use a number greater than 9 or else you'd compromise the ability to perform an upward tilt afterward. To conclude this section, downward pivot tilts should have their lockouts kept to 4 frames, not 8 frames as the committee is proposing. However, the committee's method of nerfing upward pivot tilts by more than 4 frames has merit. The number of 9 frames should be used in the event that the committee's method is enforced. The issue, unfortunately, is that there is no concrete rationale for choosing between the minimum number of 4 and the maximum number of 9, which is why the lockouts category is somewhat arbitrary. All in all, I believe that the committee has made valid suggestions here, but it isn't necessary to swap from 4 to 9 until there's data suggesting that 4 isn't enough. The next change is the addition of a lockout for up tilt from crouch. The committee is proposing for this input sequence to be addressed when it's performed in less than 3 frames. The up tilt from crouch sequence is unique because it requires you to travel a decent distance across the analog stick and then stop at tilt coordinates. There's no doubt that this is easier to do on a box. I'm in agreement with the committee that this is the only other technique I know of that may warrant the addition of a lockout. 
Unfortunately, the issue with uptilt from crouch is that the rationale for choosing how many frames it should be locked out by isn't very strong. For this reason, my verdict is that the committee has made yet another valid suggestion here, but it's hard to definitively argue that anything past the two existing lockouts should be enforced. The last lockout being proposed is the addition of a Pulse Smash DI lockout. Pulse SDI is the term I use to describe when a single direction is pressed repeatedly, which is what the committee is addressing here. The main way that Pulse SDI can be utilized on official box firmware is through the double tap method, which is performed by pressing the same button with the middle and index fingers in succession. This method isn't common because it requires you to adjust your hand positioning, but it's worth learning. With that being said, I believe this method is unnecessary to regulate due to the GameCube controller having access to an even more potent method called Wank SDI, which is mentioned in the box manifesto. Wank SDI is a method that's performed by situating the stick with your thumb and alternating the entire controller against it. Wizrobe uses this method a lot, for anyone wondering why his SDI is so good. Something to note is that the committee's reason for enforcing a Pulse SDI lockout is tied to their decision to enforce Neutral SOCD. Neutral SOCD is an input system which makes it so that when opposite cardinals are held, the analog stick outputs neutral. This can be used to exploit Pulse SDI because it lets you press right, and then press left to go back to neutral, and then release left to go back to right. As explained on the Hitbox website, this is the best way to input write twice as quickly as possible. The reason I refrain from addressing this exploit is because I'll be advising against the neutral SOCD system in a moment. Pulse SDI is the perfect example of how the lockout's category needs to be kept within reason. This lockout doesn't make the cut based on its parallels with Wank SDI, which is the GameCube controller's more potent SDI method. The Pulse SDI exploit that's enabled by neutral SOCD can be disregarded, since I'll be advising against that change as well. Next, we'll be diving into the quality of life intrusions category. We'll start with neutral SOCD since it was just mentioned at the end of the last section. One of the reasons I'm against neutral SOCD is that it enables the double input exploit that we went over, but there are several other reasons as well. The enforcement of neutral SOCD is intended to nerf the box. However, it doesn't achieve this in the healthy way that the gameplay mechanic nerfs do. Instead, it does so by enforcing a clunky input system which compromises the user experience. This can be seen in the fact that in order to dash left then right, you have to make sure that left has been released or else right won't produce the desired input. The consequence of failing to release left in this case is that an attempted dash won't come out, which hurts the intuitiveness of the controller and subjects it to a penalty that the GameCube controller doesn't have to run the risk of. The way changes like these ought to be evaluated is based on whether the gain in competitive fairness justifies the quality of life that's lost, and so the question is what competitive fairness is actually gained by enforcing neutral SOCD. The answer is not much. I say this because neutral SOCD only truly nerfs the box in situations where you have to output left then right on the very next frame. In any situation where you have more time than that, neutral SOCD serves as more of an annoyance than anything. There aren't many areas of the game that require you to press left, then right on the very next frame. However, I'll provide an example of how neutral SOCD creates problems with one of them. When you ledge dash on the box, you always want to make sure that the analog stick is pointed forward when you double jump so that you receive the best trajectory of 1.0. Neutral SOCD conflicts with this because if you ledge fall with back, then you have to release back on the next frame in order to output forward, which can be thought of as an additional one frame input. However, this can be circumvented by ledge falling with C-Stick Down, since that button is immune to neutral SOCD. The issue is that C-Stick Down isn't in an ergonomic location for a ledge dash sequence, but there is incentive to use it regardless if neutral SOCD is enforced. All in all, there are quite a few reasons I'm against neutral SOCD. The main one is that it hardly improves competitive integrity relative to how much QOL is lost, as the game can be played almost identically with enough practice. Aside from that, things worth noting are the fact that neutral SOCD requires there to be a pulse SDI timing lockout, the fact that the GameCube controller has no equivalent of being able to fail an attempted dash, and the fact that an unergonomic input sequence is incentivized for ledge dashing. The next change being proposed is probably the least competitive of them all. Coordinate fuzzing is a feature which makes it so that whenever the box attempts to pinpoint a coordinate, it does not actually pinpoint that coordinate, but rather a random coordinate within a surrounding 3x3 grid. To be clear, this means that RNG is being added to the controller. To make matters worse, arbitrary numbers are being added as well. This is because there's no reason the surrounding grid can't be expanded to 5x5, 7x7, etc. if this change is allowed. 
The inclusion of coordinate fuzzing suggests that the committee feels that there's a need to replicate every aspect of an analog stick's imprecision, which isn't true. The box is a different input device, and so long as band coordinates aren't being pinpointed, then there is nothing inherently wrong with being able to pinpoint the same coordinate 100% of the time. One of the only cases in favor of randomization that I can think of is the fact that Pikachu is able to consistently move to the same location with up B, which is admittedly unrealistic. However, we have to weigh the benefits of nerfing something like that against the downsides of doing so, and in this case there's too much collateral damage. This is because fuzzing compromises the angle distribution for up B by making it so that the box cannot use values that are fully pressed against certain parameters, which is something I'll explain later on in the video. To conclude this section, coordinate fuzzing should be vetoed due to its introduction of RNG and arbitrary numbers, as well as the fact that there's nothing inherently wrong with pinpointing a legal coordinate 100% of the time. Adding variance to Pikachu's up B is the only exception I can think of that makes sense. However, the collateral damage that fuzzing causes to the overall angle distribution cannot be justified. Finally, the last quality of life intrusion being proposed is the travel time algorithm. The implications of the travel time algorithm are very extreme, as the algorithm effectively turns the box into an analog-digital hybrid. To explain what I mean by this, the official box firmware has always operated by being able to pinpoint coordinates without following a travel route along the way. When you go from the center point to the end point, for example, you'll skip straight from point A to point B. The travel time algorithm makes it so that the box is able to be pulled at any of the values along the way, which is a drastic change to the controller. The strength of the algorithm is a 6 millisecond delay when going to an endpoint value, and 12 milliseconds when going to an interior value. The travel time algorithm is similar to the up B and air dodge nerfs that are present on the box, in the sense that those are intended to simulate human limitations. This page from the manifesto is a bit outdated, but the concept I want to highlight is where I write that an air dodge takes off on frame 1, whereas Fox's up B offers you 42 frames to aim. I use this as the justification for nerfing up B angles by less than air dodge angles on the box, which many people found to be a good design choice. The committee's decision to nerf endpoint values by less than interior values is very similar, as the thought process is that interior values require a gentler motion to pinpoint with an analog stick. There are a few differences here, however, the main one being that choosing angles is a necessary part of the box's design, whereas the inclusion of a travel time algorithm isn't. As with neutral SOCD and coordinate fuzzing, these types of changes need to have strong justifications behind them in order to warrant the problems that they introduce. The first aspects of the travel time algorithm that I'd like to bring attention to are the numbers of 6 and 12 milliseconds. The rationale behind these numbers isn't nearly as concrete as the rationale behind the up B and air dodge coordinates that are used on the box. Just like how the size of the coordinate fuzzing grid can be contended, a box player could contend that they're deserving of less nerfed numbers, hence why it's best to avoid this conversation entirely. Another issue is that unlike with an analog stick, a box player is unable to sense the physical feedback of knowing where they're pointing along their travel route. Whenever a GameCube controller is pulled, it will always feel right to the person using it, whereas a box player doesn't have that luxury. This hurts the intuitiveness of the controller even further. Furthermore, such a drastic overhaul wouldn't come without collateral damage. The main instance of collateral damage that's caused by the travel time algorithm is the fact that it prevents the L and R buttons from being able to serve as non-dedicated modifiers. I haven't covered non-dedicated modifiers too much yet, but this is something to keep in mind as we enter the final stages of the committee's changes. Conclusively, the travel time algorithm overhauls the box to a degree that couldn't possibly justify the integrity that's gained. The box's up B and air dodge behavior is the one area of the controller which requires human error to be measured to an extent, but thankfully those mechanics have a concrete rationale behind the coordinates they use. The travel time algorithm, on the other hand, introduces measurements that aren't nearly as agreeable or necessary. The algorithm also compromises the intuitiveness of the box, since there is no physical feedback for knowing where you are along its travel route. Lastly, the fact that the algorithm prevents the L and R buttons from serving as non-dedicated modifiers is enough to justify vetoing it single-handedly. Now that we've gone over everything else, it's finally time to address the committee's changes to gameplay mechanics. To recap what the phrase gameplay mechanics is in reference to, these are the in-game mechanics which can have their power levels shifted in order to equalize the box and GameCube controller. The committee has made changes to up B and air dodge, which are the two mechanics that would appear to be customizable at first glance. I'll be explaining how I was able to find a firm rationale for these two mechanics, and why there shouldn't be any adjustments made to them. On the current box patch, the up B angle distribution is what's currently being shown on screen. 
The main aspect of this distribution that I'd like to explain is how the shallowest and steepest angles were chosen. These are the ones you'll produce by holding down modifier X or Y by themselves. The first step toward choosing these angles was banning some of the coordinates that hug the X and Y axes the hardest. There's a technique which requires the two smallest X values to be banned, and then there's another technique which requires the smallest Y value to be banned. Although only one Y value has to be banned, the value after that isn't used either so that the X and Y axes can mirror each other. The next relevant threshold is the teeter threshold. The last walk value in the game that doesn't break teeter is 0.7375. The box pushes its coordinates as far out as possible within these parameters in order to produce angles of 23 and 67 degrees. These are nerfed by 6.2 degrees relative to the best angles in the game. On the committee's firmware, the outermost angles are different. The major change that I want to bring attention to is the modifier X angle. The angle is nerfed by an additional 1.8 degrees, which is an unwarranted gameplay change. The box's up B angling capabilities are already worse than the GameCube controllers, especially when Firefox notches are factored in. In terms of why this change has to happen on the committee's firmware though, it actually has nothing to do with a deliberate game balance change on their end. As I mentioned earlier, the committee removed the ability for L and R to act as non-dedicated modifiers. This is relevant because those buttons support better functionality for the up B angling system. On the official box firmware, you're able to pinpoint a 23 degree up B angle with modifier X or Y by itself. Then you can modify your coordinates to different ones when L or R is held. These different coordinates are needed because they're within the shield tilt range, which the controller has to be able to access. Since the committee's firmware has to be able to access the shield tilt range, but at the same time can't use L or R to modify its coordinates, the better angle has to be scrapped and up B has to be nerfed by 1.8 degrees. The next aspect of the committee's up B distribution is one that I'm strongly against. As you might remember, I mentioned that coordinate fuzzing was used to justify the committee's up B distribution in some capacity. This was in reference to their modifier X coordinate. The committee's modifier X coordinate doesn't hug the shield tilt parameters as perfectly as it should because it can't be allowed to fuzz outside of the parameters. To be exact, the coordinate has to be kept one value away from the very end so that the fuzzing radius remains within. This means that if not for fuzzing, the coordinate would be able to be pushed outward by one value. The angle it produces would be shallower by 0.4 degrees as a result. This is yet another reason why fuzzing is an absurd inclusion, as it compromises up B despite the fact that it has no relation to that mechanic. Although 0.4 degrees might not seem like much, an arbitrary nerf shouldn't be influencing our rationale in any capacity. The next issue with the committee's firmware is that the modifier Y angle wasn't made to mirror the one that modifier X uses. As you can see, the modifier Y angle is nerfed by 6.3 degrees, which is less than the 8 degree nerf that's given to modifier X. The committee's logic here is that only modifier X needs to be compromised so that it can accommodate the shield tilt range. However, the fact that the coordinates don't mirror is a design decision that I never would have allowed to go through. Modifier Y does need to be given an 8 degree nerf here as well for the sake of symmetry. To conclude this section, the committee's up B angle distribution is less healthy than the official box firmware's distribution. The combination of having to tug modifier X's coordinate into the shield tilt range and then account for coordinate fuzzing as well makes for a nerf of 1.8 degrees, which is unwarranted since up B is already balanced. Then the fact that modifier Y doesn't mirror modifier X needs to be addressed. Finally, the last change we'll be going over is the removal of the L and R non dedicated modifiers. As I mentioned very early on, this change is actually a buff to the box. I'll start by explaining the dual purpose of the L and R non-dedicated modifiers on the official box firmware. The official box firmware uses up B coordinates that are nerfed by 6.2 degrees for reasons that I explained earlier. However, this angle is too strong to be used for air dodge because of how quickly air dodge has to be aimed. This is addressed by making it so that when L or R is held, the coordinates are adjusted to ones that are nerfed by 13.7 degrees. The two coordinates being shown on screen produce the exact same angle. However, modifier X's angle is tugged in so that it can be within the shield tilt range. This coordinate is very resourceful because it acts as a nerfed air dodge angle and a shield tilt coordinate simultaneously. Next I'll explain how this angle was chosen. There's a page in the manifesto which explains that Fox needs to air dodge at exactly this angle or better in order to ledge dash on frame 6, which is a technique that he needs to be able to perform. This is done by ledge falling with back, overriding back with forward, double jumping with 1.0 trajectory, and then air dodging with modifier X and the R button. 
As you can see, the R button modifies the air dodge coordinates on the exact frame the air dodge occurs. You might remember that earlier on I mentioned that the travel time algorithm is responsible for the fact that the committee had to remove the L and R non-dedicated modifiers. I'll explain why this is the case. The travel time algorithm makes it so that the committee's firmware needs 12 milliseconds to make it to an interior coordinate. This means that if the L or R button instructs the box to point at a new coordinate, a travel route will be drawn between your previous coordinate and the new one. The game will then pull your controller very shortly afterward. However, if the travel route hasn't completed by the time you're pulled, then you'll receive whatever angle it's hovering above. This means that L and R can't act as non-dedicated modifiers if the travel time algorithm is being used, as they would effectively cause your wave dash lengths to be RNG. Since the committee's firmware can't make use of L and R as non-dedicated modifiers, it has to use the same angle for air dodge as it does for up B. This means that the shallowest air dodge angle on the committee's firmware is 24.8 degrees, which is 5.6 degrees better than the official box firmware. I've noted that the buff is in fact 5.6 degrees, not 5.7 degrees due to rounding. The decision to buff the box's air dodge by 5.6 degrees is an extremely unhealthy gameplay change. 5.6 degrees makes for a staggering wave dash buff that's easily enough to undo several of the nerfs the committee has given. There are sections in the box manifesto which emphasize how important it is to keep wave dash weak, since that aspect of the controller is automated and so the user shouldn't be rewarded with a strong value. The committee has disregarded this type of careful rationale by making this change. This also means that the committee's angles are less healthy than the official firmware's angles on both fronts. The committee's up B angles are nerfed when they shouldn't be, and their air dodge angles are buffed, which they shouldn't be either. That brings me to one last subject I'll cover within this section, which is an article that's titled, The Box Wave Dash Nerf is a Fox Buff. The article is written by a member of the committee, which is why I need to bring attention to it. The general premise of this article is false and misinformative. The article claims that the box's air dodge nerf is actually a buff because when you air dodge on frame 2 a full hop, you'll spend 2 frames hovering in the air, whereas angles shallower than that can hover for up to 5 frames. The article is correct about these numbers. As you can see, Fox hovers for 2 frames when he air dodges with the box's angle on frame 2, whereas he hovers for 5 frames when he air dodges with the shallowest angle in the game. What the article overlooks, however, is the fact that there's an input sequence that can be used to neutralize this advantage. I covered this input sequence in a video from last year which was called The Truth About Wave Dashing. What the video explains is the best way to wave dash is to use not one but two triggers every single time. By surrounding the first airborne frame with two air dodge poles, you're able to turn perfect wave dashes into a two frame window, which effectively makes them guaranteed. This removes the issue of hovering in midair, which means that the shallowest air dodge angle is in fact the best one in the game. This also means that the claim the article makes about the box's angle being advantageous isn't true. To conclude this section, the committee's firmware buffs air dodge by 5.6 degrees due to the travel time algorithm preventing L and R from being usable as non-dedicated modifiers. This is a very unhealthy gameplay change, as the box's air dodge should be kept as weak as possible. To recap this chapter of the video, here are the key takeaways. Semi-arbitrary lockouts are an unclean nerf method, but they're mandatory in some capacity. Double quarter circle SDI and downward pivot tilts have to be nerfed by 4 frames, and upward pivot tilts have to be nerfed by at least 4 frames. The committee's best suggestion is to nerf upward pivot tilts by forcing tap jump. This is the only way to nerf upward pivot tilts by more than 4 frames, and so it has merit. However, there ought to be data supporting the need to swap to this method, and currently there's none. In the event that upward pivot tilts ever proved to be abusable with the current 4 frame lockout, then we should swap to this method and use a 9 frame lockout. The second best suggestion the committee makes is to add a lockout for up tilt out of crouch. I agree that this technique is on the cusp of warranting a lockout. However, the fact that there is no good justification for the exact number of frames that should be used makes me advise against it. The next set of changes are the committee's quality of life intrusions, which all ought to be vetoed for their own different reasons. These changes don't work well in general due to the minimal competitive integrity that's gained in comparison to the collateral damage that's caused. Neither neutral SOCD, coordinate fuzzing, nor the travel time algorithm cleanly nerf anything in particular, but what they do is cause all sorts of other issues. These include requiring additional timing lockouts in order to prevent exploits, compromising intuitive dash dancing, incentivizing the usage of unergonomic input sequences, introducing RNG to the controller, introducing arbitrary numbers to the controller, compromising the intuitiveness of knowing which coordinates you're pinpointing,
and most importantly, offsetting the box's up B and air dodge angle distributions. The committee's proposed angle distributions involve a 1.8 degree up B nerf and a 5.6 degree air dodge buff, both of which are unhealthy changes. The 5.6 degree air dodge buff is extremely concerning in particular, as that buff is enough to negate several of the nerfs that are being proposed. In summary, the committee's firmware consists of a bunch of changes which compromise the user experience, which are then compensated with a buff to the area of the game that desperately needs to be kept as weak as possible. This isn't an acceptable way to adjust the box in the slightest. With all due respect, the committee should not be allowed to enforce this firmware. That brings me to the solution, as well as what I believe the best roadmap for implementing it is. Early on in the video, I explained that there are a number of gameplay mechanics that are deliberately nerfed on the box, as well as 12 mechanics that the box has an automatic advantage in. Within the list of nerfs, I've defended the rationale for up B and air dodge, and shown why they shouldn't be changed. That brings us to the automatic advantage category, which we haven't covered yet. The only way to address these advantages is by modifying the game on a software level, which the Melee community has already done to some extent. Universal Controller Fix has had full fixes for dashback and wiggle out of tumble, as well as a partial fix for shield drop on version 0.8, which has existed for quite some time. Recently, UCF was updated to version 0.84, which adds a full fix for SDI on frame 2 of hit lag and a partial fix for 1.0 cardinal. While this is progress, most of the automatic advantages remain unaddressed. Before we continue any further, I'd like to rewind to 2017 and show some of the sentiments that were expressed back during the UCF adoption process. The UCF website suggests that dashback and shield drop are paramount in comparison to anything else. While this is certainly true, UCF has gone on to address other mechanics since then, which goes to show that the original sentiment is outdated. Another outdated sentiment can be seen in a statement that was made by Meili at Omni back during this time period. The statement explained that there was an ongoing conversation about controller mods, which implies that the rationale wasn't well understood and still in the process of being figured out. Fast forward 6 years, and what I can advise is that the endgame solution is to address the entirety of the automatic advantage category, which means that UCF isn't going far enough. Many of the mechanics that fall under this category weren't known about back in 2017, but times have changed since then. Two years ago, my company began providing a separate product called 1.03. 1.03 is a memory card and ISO which provides all of the automatic advantages to the GameCube controller, and so together with the box's built-in nerfs, gameplay mechanics end up being balanced in as many areas as possible. In terms of how this ought to be adopted, the best roadmap was laid out in a video I released last year. The video was titled, Recommended Update to Universal Controller Fix. What the video explained is that the UCF brand name ought to be preserved for maximum effectiveness. The video showed an example of how the phrase 1.03 would only be in reference to the ISO as a whole, while UCF would be in reference to the controller fix. This would allow people to continue to use terminology they're familiar with by describing the new changes as a UCF update. UCF would also continue to exist as a separate gecko code which Slippy would automate. This would mean that the usage of 1.03 wouldn't be necessary in order to play with these changes. The next aspect of the roadmap for adoption is something I came up with more recently. Up until this point, I've advised for all of the automatic advantages to be given to the GameCube controller at once. I've since realized that this would be too dramatic of a change. My current stance is that this ought to be done in three waves so the GameCube controller users can take the time to familiarize themselves with the changes. The first wave would consist of changes that should inarguably be made to the existing versions of UCF. As I mentioned earlier, UCF's dashback and wiggle fixes are fine, but its shield drop and 1.0 cardinal fixes are only partial. I'll show what I mean by this through a diagram. This diagram shows the shield drop range that's used on UCF.8, which is the version most people are familiar with. The 1.0 cardinal range is what's used on UCF.84, which came out more recently. Both of these ranges are completely arbitrary, as their cutoffs don't correspond with anything in-game. The first step the Melee community should take is correcting these ranges into the ones that are now being shown. These are the maximum ranges that can legally be given. Something else worth noting is that with this change, shield drop resembles other out of shield options like roll and spot dodge. The next wave of changes is the one that closes the gap between GameCube controller and box by a significant margin. The first thing you might have noticed is that I moved the SDI on frame 2 of hit lag fix to this wave. Even though SDI on frame 2 of hit lag is addressed on UCF.84, it would be more appropriate to pair this fix with a separate one that's called the SDI remainder fix. I'll give a brief explanation of each of the fixes that are being proposed here, since they're less well known than the ones in Wave A. The first fix I'll be covering is the SDI on frame 2 of hit lag fix. Hit lag is incurred whenever your character is hit by an attack. 
From there, the first frame of hit lag isn't eligible for SDI at all, while the second frame of hit lag has a polling issue that causes it to fail about half the time. This is similar to what causes Dashback to fail, and so it's warranted to fix on a software level. The next fix is the SDI remainder fix. This fix addresses the fact that the initial SDI input on a GameCube controller has a magnitude that's random between 0.7 and 1.0. The randomness exists because the SDI input can be stifled by an early poll. By making it so that the remaining amount is applied on the next frame, the SDI input always has a magnitude of 1.0, which is more competitive. Here's a clip of Fox having his slide off stifled by an early SDI poll for reference. If SDI was a consistent mechanic, then Fox would have made it off the platform in this situation. The next fix is vertical throws. Melee has a game design oversight in that its vertical throw range is only the vertical column. This causes people to perform accidental side throws very often. In more recent Smash titles such as Ultimate, this oversight is addressed. The vertical throw range is given a cone shape just like up tilt and down tilt, which helps improve accuracy. By modernizing the vertical throw range, we're able to create parity between the GameCube controller and box, since the box will never run into this issue when it points up or down. Next up is C-Stick Ledge Fall. An issue arises when you C-Stick Ledge Fall by pointing in a cardinal direction, then shift the C-Stick outside of the cardinal. This will cause your character to perform an aerial attack, which will often result in an SD. The way to fix this is by changing the threshold for an aerial attack to the 50 degree line, which is a threshold that's used elsewhere in the game. This equalizes the GameCube controller with the box, because digital C-Stick buttons don't run this risk. It's also worth noting that digital C-Stick buttons are an option for GameCube controllers now as well, and so this change is more than warranted on a software level. Last but not least is ADT Shield. ADT Shield is an incredibly obnoxious issue which makes it so that if you receive a light shield pull on the frame before your digital shield pull, your digital shield won't protect you from physical attacks on frames 2 and 3. This issue may have decided a set that took place between Moki and Cody earlier this year at Genesis 9. If you watch this clip closely, you'll see that Cody light shields for a frame and then gets hit on the next frame due to the ADT shield issue. Aside from the benefits of fixing ADT shield itself, another aspect that's significant is that doing so optimizes the GameCube controller's layout. If the L trigger on the GameCube controller is given the ADT shield fix, then it's able to light shield and analog L cancel all while providing an ADT immune shield. This lets you perform all of those duties with your left index finger while Z-jumping with your right index finger, which makes the most of the GameCube controller's hardware. I've included a clip of me playing with this layout so that you can see it in real time. The Wave B UCF changes close the gap between GameCube controller and box tremendously. From there, the Wave C proposal contains the four least important fixes. These are Wall Jump, Duraki Wall Jump, Down B, and Dash Out of Crouch Y. I've decided to exclude the explanations for these fixes in the interest of time, but I've included references for each of them in the video description. Aside from that, there are some other notes that I figured I'd mention. I'm in favor of excluding a Z-Jump toggle from UCF, but keeping it as an option on 1.03. This means that the UCF Gecko code wouldn't contain this feature since it isn't necessary. However, it's still a good addition to the 1.03 ISO. From there, the Melee community would have to decide on Dash Out of Crouch X. Dash Out of Crouch X is in reference to the fact that there's an argument in favor of giving Dash Out of Crouch a 3-frame window. This is due to its curved travel route, which is unique. Increasing Dash Out of Crouch to 3 frames is a change that benefits both the GameCube controller and Box, and so it's debatable whether or not that should happen. Lastly, I'll be explaining the importance of Nintendo Wiis going forward. Wiis are significant because they have more processing power than GameCubes, which they can use to advance the game's visuals by a frame. The ability to advance the game's visuals is notable because some of the newer fixes that I went over cause visible differences from vanilla. These are the SDI remainder fix, the ADT shield fix, the wall jump fix, and the Duraki wall jump fix. These mechanics can be stealth through the use of a Wii, since a Wii can stay one frame ahead and fix these mechanics while remaining true to vanilla's visuals. To conclude the video, the Melee community is at a crossroads that'll determine what the future of GameCube controller and box balance looks like. The controller committee is proposing for the box to undergo all sorts of quality of life intrusions, as well as overhaul its angling system in an unhealthy way. The 1.8 degree up B nerf is unwarranted since up B is already balanced. Then the 5.6 degree air dodge buff is even less warranted because air dodge should be kept as weak as possible. Altmore and I are advising that rather than enforce this firmware, the committee ought to entertain the rationale we provided for UCF. UCF is already a partial box equalizer as it currently stands, and so an iteration which goes the full way needs to be tested. This would advance the game rather than regressing it.
The first phase of this plan involves updating Shield Drop and 1.0 Cardinal, which is long overdue. From there, the Wave B changes are what'll truly level the playing field between the two controllers. The best move for the game is for Altmore and I to merge with the committee so that we can all continue to share our expertise with each other. The committee has done great work in many GameCube controller related areas, but the rationale that we provided in this video is needed in order to make progress with the box. This is an important issue for the Melee community to resolve before 2024, and so we hope this video has been helpful. If anything else needs to be clarified, a follow-up video can be provided.